Hello, Minnesota. Welcome back. This is the Tony Hernandez Show. It's Saturday, October 19th. we got a great show today. Uh, but before we bring on our guests, we're going to have uh, Johnny Howard on. He's uh, running for the St. Paul City Council. But I wanted to give recognition to our fantastic producer, our hardworking producer here, Dallas Pearson. Uh, he actually won an award uh, with Suburban Community Channels. Uh, he won the 2013 Technical and Production Excellence Award. And uh, we're extremely thankful and grateful to have Dallas here working so hard as a producer. He does everything from making sure the cameras are set up, that the audio is correct. When we bring in Sam with Skype, he makes sure that that's all set up and everything. So uh, congratulations, Dallas, for winning the award. And uh, we wish you the best. And we thank you for all your hard work. And uh, with that, we're going to bring on our first guest. We have Mr. Johnny Howard here. Uh, his website is johnnyhoward.net, N-E-T, and uh, he's running for the St. Paul City Council. Johnny, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate this. Yeah, and you were saying that you've had a pretty busy day today so far. What, what have you been up to? We started door knocking at 9 this morning. We quit at 2 o'clock. Wow. <laughs> so we, we hit hundreds of doors. So it's just been a great day. We had close to 20 people out door knocking in the rain. So it was just a great day. But people are committed to work with this campaign and try to make St. Paul a better place. Yeah, well, it's starting to get a little uh, colder out here in, in St. Paul. I actually, I don't know if you saw, but I was kind of in your neighborhood earlier, and, and so, it looked like rain, but there was a little bit of slush and ice in there mixed in. Did they you see that out there? We might get a little snow. They said we might get a little. And so we, we got to make sure that this snow and this weather don't keep people in. We got to get people out to vote this year. And what can you remind us, what is uh, the day of the St. Paul City elections? November 5th. It's November, Tuesday, November 5th. And the smart thing to do is to write Tuesday, November 5th, vote Johnny Howard. Tuesday, November 5th, vote Johnny Howard. Yeah, that's and, the only thing you need to remember. Yeah, and your, your website, Dallas, we you put his website up on the, the, the back screen here, but your website is johnnyhoward.net. Uh, and I actually looked through your website. It looks like you have a pretty long history of community activism in St. Paul in the Frogtown neighborhood. And uh, can you just talk a little more about how you got your start in the community? Was there some sort of instance that happened, or, or was it just is that just how you've always been? You know, I moved to Minnesota in 1984. I met Council President Bill Wilson at that time. And I ended up working on his campaign and door knocking and working with him. I, in, I did an internship in Bill Wilson's office. From there, I began to do work in the neighborhood. Um, my work started in the neighborhood called the Thomasdale Neighborhood. That's um, a geographic part of Ward 1. Mm -hmm. And, you know, St. Paul is a city of a lot of neighborhoods. Oh, yeah. So the Thomasdale neighborhood, if people lived east of um, Dale Street, they said they lived in Thomasdale. But t Dale to Western, they said they lived in Frogtown. And then past that, they said they lived in Thomasdale. In the er late 80s, early 90s, that was one of the worst neighborhoods in the city of St. Paul. If there was a shooting, a drug bust, prostitution, a rape, a murder, it was in that, they called it, they said in Frogtown. Mm -hmm. I began to work, as working for Bill Wilson, I began to do organizing for him. And so I created an organization called the Thomasdale Block Club. Our mission was to develop a sense of pride in the neighborhood. And that's a big mission, but it was an important mission. So at, w at one point, people were being charged to walk up and down the streets. So we put T-shirts on neighbors that said, Frogtown Power, Frogtown Pride. Mm. We chose that because we had this negative thing, Frogtown. Mm -hmm. And so we put those Frogtown Pride, Power, Frogtown Pride on people. We had two um, sports teams. We had West Mini High High Football f Program mm -hmm. and we had Shepherd Football Program, both underfunded and, and didn't have a lot of kids on it. We brought the two teams together and we called them Frogtown Football. Wow. We didn't have a um, business incubator in our neighborhood. We created an organization called the Frogtown Action Alliance. We were intentional about the way we used the name Frogtown to take that negative and overpower it with a positive. 
Mm. We didn't have a group addressing housing, so we helped to create the Greater Frogtown Community Development Corporation to address housing. Mm. Again, we were intentional of making that um, name positive. The city was done a poor job of maintaining vacant lots and empty houses in our neighborhood. And so we created a program called Frogtown Four Seasons, and we began to clean up all the empty lots in our neighborhoods. And through that program, we created a job program where we employed felons and those hard-to-employ people. And even back in the early 90s, we were paying $13 an hour. Wow. We were paying thirteen hours an hour. Thirteen dollars an hour. What kind of work were, were, were they cutting doing? grass and shoveling snow mm -hmm. in their neighborhood? Mm -hmm. But we didn't let that X or any of those other letters stop people from trying to provide for their families. Mm -hmm. And so, what my point was, we took that negative name Frogtown and we intentionally put it on everything we did to make it positive. For Christmas, we gave every member a coffee mug that said Frogtown Power, Frogtown Pride. Hmm. And so we flipped it. So now that neighborhood is not Thomas Dale anymore. It's called the Frogtown Neighborhood Association now. Hmm. So I like to think that we played a little role in that. And the secret to that is one of the reasons I'm running. St. Paul's strength was based on citizen participation. My organization was about engaging, involving, and inviting people to be part of the process. That's where I run into problems with the city as it runs now. St. Paul's a great city that mm -hmm. can be even better, but we got to re-engage people, re-involve people, and invite them to be part of that process. So when you founded uh, these groups, did you run into any resistance, either from uh, neighbors or, or externally, or, or did people right away jump on board with what you were doing? I would say our first 10 meetings, you figure three, four, five thousand 5,000 flyers, we may have six people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and so the six of us would meet, but we door knocked and we door knocked and we door knocked and we asked people, how do you want to live? What type of neighborhood do you want? And people told us. And after we door knocked for a while, the numbers started to grow. The city was used to doing things a certain way. You know, we, we need um, police officers to get off their seats and get on their feet and walk through our neighborhood. Well, it was resistance there. We held a tribunal where we brought the mayor, the chief of police, the county attorney, all the elected officials in, and we found them guilty of allowing misdemeanor crimes to destroy our neighborhood. And so we, gave, we, we sent all those people out with marching orders. We said to the chief of police, Prostitution is a problem, so we helped to create the internet post on the Giants and Prostitutes. Mm. That came right to Thomas Dell Block up office from my desk. Mm. We went to the judges and said, it's misdemeanor crimes that's destroying, destroying our neighborhood, so we helped to create the community court position. That came right from the Thomas Dell Block Club, the community court, the community prosecutor. We, we, you have to take a look at the problem and then identify the solution, and you do it from the bottom up. Issues in your neighborhood shouldn't come from downtown. You define what you like, what you dislike. And that was our style of work. Hmm. So, uh, Johnny Howard, there's something you talked about that really caught my attention. And, and specifically, it was uh, issues with uh, people uh, in their youth. And when people make bad decisions, say when they're 18, 19, 20 years old, maybe they get some type of a, a criminal record at that point. And these records oftentimes haunt these people for the rest of their working lives, uh, whether it's a, a felony on the record or, or even now employers check your credit and they check other things. Uh, what sort of things can, can the city do if you're elected into the city council? Can you do anything to help people who want to turn the leaf over and, and, and start a new life and get back into the workforce? We have to be, we have to have, in, in the city and the county does a good job and um, internally and not letting those exes um, hold people back. But anybody, any organization or firm that's receiving city dollars, they should be held accountable too, that we can't let people's past hold them, hold, hold, hold them back for their future. And so, you know, uh, Grandma says you can look up, you can get up. 
<laughs> so you made a mistake. Mm -hmm. How do you move forward? Mm -hmm. We got to make sure we don't let people's barriers, their paths, hold them back. And so I'm pushing, and I'm going to fight for the right for felons to move forward. Mm -hmm. We can't have a productive society when we're holding people back. No doubt. And so the city has to step forward. If you're going to get city dollars, then you're going to hire our people. And some of our people got some marks. Some of our people have some flaws, mm -hmm. but these are our people. Mm -hmm. And so I want to make sure that we put people first in everything we do. That's one reason I'm running on the Green Party. The Green Party said leading, listening, and putting people first in everything we do. Think about this government shutdown. Those were two different groups of grown folks acting silly. Mm -hmm at our expense, leading, listening, and put, putting people first in everything that we do. And that's one of the reasons I want to run, and I'm proud to be running under the Green Party. Yeah, can you talk a little more about uh, what the Green Party is? Are, are there some like pillars or, or principles that the Green Party stands for? And, and how is it different from uh, the DFL? It's, it's, it's really not that much different in the philosophies, mm -hmm. but in principle, putting people first, not politics, putting people first in every decision you make. And then thinking about this is that they say our children are less than 10% of the population, 100% of the future. So if we don't pay attention to what we put in the ground, if we don't pay attention to how we take care of our land, what are we leaving for our children? If we don't begin to eat better, if we don't pay attention to transportation, if we don't begin to walk more, bike more, we're not going to be as healthy as we need to be, as we ought to be. The Green Party, the whole thing with the Green Party is take care of yourself, take care of your people, take care of your land. That's how you boil it all down. It's about being responsible citizens. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and that's the difference. The DFL and the Republican Party right now, they want to argue over, I'm a Republican, I'm a Democrat, you're a person. Yeah. We, want to, we want to work with you to do better. Mm -hmm. I think that that's an important uh, message that more and more people, it probably resonates with them. And, and are you finding that when you're going out door knocking and, and talking to your neighbors, do they ask you, you know, when you knock on a random door, do they ask you, are you a Republican, are you Democrat, or do they ask you those Every questions? Every time right I away? tell them green, I get a smile. Mm. You know, now I've had, I got some staunch, I got, I got um, three Tea Party members that got Johnny Howard lawn signs in their mm -hmm. yard. They said, would you put a Tea Party, a, a lawn sign a Tea Party, um, a Republican's yard? I said, well, yeah, you got a right to vote for the person who you think will best represent you. He said, well, I'm Tea Party, too. I said, you still got that right. But people are paying attention to, to the message that we are trying to give, that we have a responsibility. Do you know when you take elected office, you say, I want to be a public servant. Mm -hmm. I want to serve the people. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're missing. You want to represent the people, then treat, listen to them. Paul Wellstone said, when you do good, we all do good. That's part of what we are operating from. Door to door, people are saying, why aren't our streets plowed on time? And why can't we plow from curb to curb? And why do our streets get smaller and smaller? Poor management. Hmm. Poor management. I said two years ago that I had concerns with um, some of the city departments, in particular um, the Department of Safety Inspections. I said that two years ago. Three months ago, the state took over part of that department. We got to take a look at how we're managing. We pay decent and good salaries then earn them, do a better job. Mm -hmm. And uh, can you talk a little more, your past, were you born and raised in St. Paul? No, I, I'm from Michigan. Okay. You know, now, here's the deal. I'm 58 years old. Mm -hmm. And so I, I came to Minnesota when I was 28. Okay. Wet behind in the ears, kid. At 27, 28, 29 years old, you can want to do everything you can want to do. You can try to be everything that you want to be. But until you really get some time behind your belt, you know, behind you, at 28, what did I know? Really. At 29 years old, what did I really know? But I have grew up for 30 years. I've been in this neighborhood 
working and walking the streets and trying to be positive and trying to make a difference in people's lives because that's what I enjoy. Uh, you know, and, and and so, you know, and I tell people it really doesn't make a difference where you're born at. Mm -hmm. It's not in the land, it's in the man. Yeah, well, you've been here for 30 plus years, too, for, I'd say. That. All, oh, that That's my adult life. Yeah. You know, I tell people. What, br what brought you to St. Paul? I worked 30 year, 33 years for the Ford plant. Okay. And so I retired. I'm a retired auto worker. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I've been a union man all my life. My mm -hmm. whole family is union people. But what I was going to tell you, this work. In, in my days, we had Batman and Robin and Superman. They were superheroes. Superman used to leap off of tall buildings and stop locomotives. <laughs> That's superhero. Mm -hmm. I believe when you can feed the hungry, when you can help homeless people get into housing, that's superhero work. And I get a kick out of that when I find somebody that's struggling and say, we can do better. You can do better. Let me work with you. Mm -hmm. Let me show you how to do this. I can't do it for you. But as you work with me, I'm going to show you how to do it, how to get there. Together we can make a difference. And that's the message that we got to teach and get back into St. Paul. Our district council system is where the neighbors organize we set up the zoning requirements in our neighborhood. We talk about how we want our neighborhoods and the hours we want our um, public facilities open. We should be talking about the infrastructure, what we want in our neighborhoods. And we got to tell people that's your responsibility and that's your power. Mm -hmm. And then with uh, you said you worked for the, the Ford plant. You retired with Ford. What were your feelings uh, when there was talk about closing down the Ford plant? Was that something that, that you had feelings for either side? And, and do you think that the city should have done something to try to keep the Ford plant? It, it, it shocked me. I, I think that um, the city probably got involved too late. I think the decisions were made. Um, and I think they probably got involved too late. That's one of the problems I have with the current leadership in City Hall, in particular Ward 1, it seems like we're an afterthought in everything that happens. You know, with the Ford plant, I think the city got involved in that conversation too late. But in Ward 1, light rail's here. Hopefully it's going to be a great thing. But around light rail, we're thinking backwards. We should have had a parking plan before we broke ground. We should have had a better plan to address business retention and how to help how to help these businesses survive mm -hmm. before we broke ground. Mm -hmm. And those are the concerns I have with the way we do things in the city. We shouldn't be an afterthought. We should be at the we should be at the table. Mm -hmm. And we and, and so often we're not at the table when the job when this thing was being designed. There should have been a plan. How are we going to guarantee the St. Paul people in my and in, in my case in particular? How are we going to guarantee that Ward One people people are trained and ready to go to work? And 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 that didn't happen. We got to make sure when these new stadiums are built, we should have training programs in place right now, training our workforce to be ready to do that work. Mm -hmm. and, and and that's leadership. Is that is that happening right no, now? No, it's not. The, these plans. And, you are know, you know, we're one of the most. You know, old McDonald had a meeting here, a meeting there, a meeting everywhere, a meeting, meeting. <laughs> that's the that's the, the that's the style on Ward One right now under the current administrations in the past few years. They meet. They meet to meet, but they never make a difference in the lives of Ward 1 people. And so we need a, a plan to address training people, getting people ready to work, mm -hmm. training them on the soft skills of employment. We're going to teach you how to do these jobs, but the soft skill says five minutes to late is, five minutes to eight is late. Get there on time. Be ready to work. Mm -hmm. And so those are things we got to talk about publicly. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about that a little more then. Okay, so say the people of uh, Ward 1 elect Johnny Howard to the city council. Uh, a relevant issue moving forward is the St. Paul St. Stadium. It's a lot of people that are looking to perhaps build that in the downtown area. What can you do uh, as a city councilman to start making those plans you know you talk meeting is one thing but how do you take that to the next step and produce that into measurable actions my my entire career in neighborhood organizing has been about partner been around partnerships 
collaboration and relationships. And so right away, we need to start partnering with tra um, the people that are, that are employing and training people. Understand, we got unions here. And if you are a laid off union worker, you wouldn't want to see this new kid that just turned 21 working and you sitting at home laid off. But we should have internships. We should have um, mentorships where they can begin to learn. You don't, you don't want the rookie electrician plugging up the wires. But we got to have the relationships to start getting these people ready, ready to work. So day one, I want to build relationships with the, with the organizations that's going to be bidding these jobs, with the contractors that are going to be designing these things. It's about relationships and collaborations and training. You know, and, and so that's been my history. Mm -hmm. I've, I've worked with, I used to do this event called Reclaim the Community Month, 31 days. So if you can think about planning one large event, the, 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 the work it takes to put an event together, we planned 31 days of events back to back. Wow. And so we had to have a lot of partnerships and a lot of relationships, but that's how you build neighborhood. People knowing people. People working with people. That's crime prevention and that's neighborhood building. You know, we have 600 police officers roughly in St. Paul. That's 1,200 eyes. No way in the world they could see this entire city. So one of the things I trained in my block club organizing is that we must be the eyes and ears for the police department. At the same time, we, we, we have to be the, 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 um, the heartbeat, the pulse of our neighborhoods. How do you want to live? That's a big question. Mm -hmm. And you've been living in St. Paul for, for quite some time. I was born and raised in St. Paul, and I've seen some changes. You know, the, the core of the city, it, it's, still, it's still there. It's still intact. There's no doubt. Uh, you know, crime is something that you've been deeply involved with within your community. And I want to know your opinion. Has the level of crimes or the types of crimes, have they changed over the last 30 years of the frequency, or is it pretty much the same show that we're dealing with now that, w that we are back then? Is it, is it the same, or has it changed here in St. Paul? It, it, it's, it's gotten better. St. Paul, and this is just my opinion now, mm -hmm. St. Paul has did a real good job in addressing crime prevention. It started, um, now I started my, my walk in crime prevention with Bill McCutcheon. And then uh, when, when Corky Finney became chief, he started pushing what's called community policing. That's police and community, police in the neighborhood working together. And so St. Paul has held its own. We got issues in St. Paul, and there's been some problems in St. Paul. But St. Paul, in my opinion, is ahead of the game with most cities with our law enforcement community. Mm -hmm. We got some pretty dedicated people. Um, our current chief and our current sheriff, they came from the rank and file. They, um, they used to walk with me down Reclaim the Community Month. Mm. And so I, I, I like to think about that, that um, I used to lead them around the neighborhood. Now they lead the city. Mm. But, you know, St. Paul has did a good job in the area of crime prevention. What we have to do is get our neighbors now to start organizing again. Cut your, you cut your porch light on tonight. I'll cut mine on tomorrow night. And then you cut yours on next night. That's crime prevention. Neighborhood organizing crime prevention. Um, sit on your porch. And everybody ride down your street. Speak to them. Don't let anybody, don't let any strangers come to your neighborhood and not know that somebody's looking at you and their neighbors looking out for each other. St. Paul has did a great job and a good job in the area of crime prevention. Now, what we got to do mm -hmm. is community building. Um, these young boys that's acting, acting foolish. How do we begin to address that issue? These are bad boys. And so we got to create and identify programs. Hopefully we can get them in programs instead of prison. Hopefully we can get them back in school instead of prison. Mm -hmm. And so we got to be, make sure we have them programs to get these boys in to try to get them off the street. Um, at the YWCA of St. Paul, they got this program called the Impact Program. In that program, we're teaching um, employment, 
um, job readiness, but more importantly, I, I used to teach over there. I, I facilitated a class, and at the beginning of every day, we did a positive quote. And we asked those children that were Christians, get up every morning and thank God you're a Christian. If not, find every morning get up and give yourself a positive affirmation. Find something good about you because before the day's over with, something's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Go back to that positive moment and never have another bad day, have a bad moment. But be positive. So we got to figure out how to approach these young boys mm -hmm. on the street. And let me tell you, I hate sagging. I hate these boys walking around with their pants down and have pride in yourself. And so we got to start having public conversations with these young guys. You can do better. You can be better. And so it, it, it goes to parenting. What are you teaching? What are you showing your kids? TV is one of the best babysitters in the world. You can put your TV on channel two. Your child is going to learn, please, thank you, and pardon me. You go up a few channels and you know what they're learning. Mm. And so parents are going to really start paying attention to what they're allowing their ch children to hear. And then as a neighborhood, we got to set standards on what we want in our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So we got to look at programs for these boys, not prison. Mm -hmm. So on top of that, we, we've had guests in the past. We had a school board candidate, uh, Chu Vu. Uh, we've also had a, a gentleman ma named uh, Danelle Tenner who wrote a book on education and closing in on the achievement gap. And specifically here in Minnesota and Twin Cities and, and St. Paul, uh, there's a pretty sizable achievement gap by measure of mathematics, uh, reading comprehension, and graduation rates among African Americans, Hispanic Americans, and Hmong Americans uh, right here in St. Paul. Uh, so there's a definite division uh, among the races that way. And I guess I'm wondering, you know, I know you're running for the city council, but what is the relationship between the city council and the school board? And is there anything that you can do to, to, to foster this relationship to help African-American students, Hispanic students, and, and Hmong American students here in St. Paul? Yeah. You know, I've um, been the neighborhood organizer for over 30 years. I'm blessed that I've had a lot of great people around me. I've never had the chance to run a community-based organization that dealt specifically with, with African-American people. I've served on some boards with some African-American groups, but in the neighborhood, when you want to talk about the achievement gap from the city council, the city council's job starts with when your child walks out of the door, when they get to the schoolhouse door, they ought to make sure that child is safe and that walk or that ride to school is safe. I believe that the city councilman's job is to address what I call the opportunity gap. If mom and dad has a decent paying job, a livable wage, and they don't have to get off work and go back to work, I think that would give them time to read to their child or have their child read to them. I think that begins to address part of the education issue in our neighborhood. If you can't teach a hungry child, if a child is coming out of a dysfunctional neighborhood, di just disorderly neighborhood, then that child is going to be hard to teach in school. If you as parents are running a dysfunctional home, you're raising an unteachable child. And so what we got to do is make sure, first of all, that we help mom and dad get to work mm -hmm. and get a decent job. Mm -hmm. And then we got to make sure that we got decent, affordable housing so that a child has a base. Because as you move in every 90 days, that's going to that's gonna disrupt your education. Let me stop here and say this. A friend of mine always says this the best social service program in the world is a job. Mm. So I don't want to create any social service programs. What I want to do is talk about hope, love, and possibilities. And so we want to get people to work and tell them dream with and dream for your child. We can do that from the city council seat. We can make sure that you have a great neighborhood, that when you come home, you feel good about it. Yeah. That you got a decent paying job and you've got a decent home, Read to your child. If, you, if everyone would take the next 12 months, 
don't take a budget increase or anything and pay a little bit more attention to your babies hmm. and begin to read with your child. We got um, English as a second language classes, right? Mm -hmm. Well, we got some folks born and raised right here in America that messed up and got caught up in life and they didn't finish school. So we got to get them back in school and, and, and educate yourself as your children get educated. Mm -hmm. We got to go right back to the home and start doing a better job of being parents. Let me read with you, baby. Mm -hmm. Read to me. Let, yeah. Let's work on these problems that's a, that's a That's a very powerful idea that you just brought up. Could you imagine our city, St. Paul, if every parent took 10 minutes a night and read a short book Wouldn't to take their, any money to their kid. It. Wouldn't take any money. Be an unbelievable result if every yeah. parent would just read with their kids for ten minutes every single night. Yeah, be uh, unbelievable. But I'm I'm glad that you're bringing up the jobs issue uh, in St. Paul in particular. If you study the the history, the business history of St. Paul, uh, you know, go back forty years, downtown St. Paul, the the area. You had the Ford plant. You had uh, Whirlpool. Uh, West Publishing used to be uh, right downtown. We had mm -hmm. all these huge private employers that provided very decent wages and salaries for residents of St. Paul. And a lot of these uh, businesses they have either they're gone uh, to the suburb areas or they've left the state completely. And uh, I'd like to know, Johnny Howard, if you're elected, uh, what can the city do to foster an environment where uh, either businesses want to come back and plant some roots in St. Paul or the entrepreneur, small businessman or woman can start a business and, and grow right here in the city. And, and then also I want to know is, do you think St. Paul is a, a business friendly city? Two things. You, you really gave the answer in your comment. St. Paul, to me, our responsibility is to create a city that you want to bring your business to. That means we could have decent parks, decent recreation center, good schools, so that I not only want to bring my business here, I want to bring my family here. So how we address the infrastructure, the big picture, how we make St. Paul look, that's really important. I served on the city's business review council in the early 90s. Our charge was to make St. Paul a friendlier place to do business. I think they're missing it right now. Mm. It's not friendly. And it, it, it's not friendly. It's too hard. And we don't have the programs to help businesses get off the ground right now as a city. In the 80s and 90s, St. Paul had a loan program for startup businesses. They don't do that right now. We got to make St. Paul, a, it's not as friendly as it could be. Mm -hmm. It's not friendly as it should be. Mm -hmm. But we have to make St. Paul so attractive that people are looking, I, I want to bring my business over there. And, 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 and we can't give it away neither. We, we can't cut it out. We can't, we can't cut taxes with all of them. We just got to make our city so attractive that people want to come here. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine, too, the part of it is just planting seeds in the minds of our youth, you know, where they believe that they can achieve, that they believe that if they have an idea, if they work hard for it, they, they can see that idea grow into fruition where it creates other jobs and helps other people support their families. The it's last job I had, one of the things we did with our young people is we told them we need you to dream and we encourage mm. you to dream. And so we, we took them on job sites just to meet with people. How can you dream about being an architect as you've never seen one? And we took them down to the police department and we talked about the different jobs within that department. You know, we need more people of color in our police departments, but they got to see that as a career in a in a in a in a in a, in a, in a honorable a honorable career, and so we got to see the police in a different light, and that starts in the neighborhood. That starts in our rec centers, in our schools, not done a drug raid or a drug bus or a car accident. It's walking the street, introducing yourself. That's community policing. And they need to see, they need to see these jobs. And so we got to do a better job. I say we got to promote St. Paul, neighborhood by neighborhood, ward by ward. Mm. 
Well, we're almost uh, coming to the end of our time, Johnny Howard. Uh, I just wanted to give these last like a minute or so to talk a little more about the, the nitty gritty details of the campaign. Uh, first of all, Ward 1, St. Paul. Uh, can you describe the geography of, of Ward 1 in St. Paul? Sure. We go from Summit South, front, that's the north north end, um, north end side of the ward, okay. Snelling to the west, and John Ireland um, to the east. So that's all of Ramsey Hill, all of Frogtown, Thomasdale, all of Summit U, um, all the Lex Ham neighborhood and part of the Snell Hamlin neighborhood. All of that's Ward 1. Okay. And then for people who live in Ward 1 in these neighborhoods, how do they uh, get out to make sure that they're registered? I is there a place that they can go to, to see if they're registered and if not, that they can register to vote? In St. Paul, you can register day of. Okay. So Go to my website, johnnyhoward.net, and we'll be able to tell you um, where you vote at, and, and, and so we'll, we'll direct you where to vote at. But in St. Paul, that's one of the great things about uh, our state is you can um, register on the day of election. Okay, no. and uh, the, the last question is, um, in St. Paul, I, I can't remember, do they have that ranked choice voting? It is ranked choice. And, and can you just explain briefly, because I don't think anyone fully, fully understands it yet as it's being implemented, but, but how, does it how does it work? Yeah. Well, I got my own analogy. Yeah. Yeah, if you ever been to the horse track, you got win, place, or show. Mm -hmm. And that's my way of explaining ranked choice voting. Win, Johnny Howard, rank somebody else, and somebody else is your show. And so it's really, if you know that this is your number one person, and you, you feel good about this person, but this, 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 this candidate here, they've just been terrible, and I don't agree with anything they say, but this one here I might could live with. So you, you, you just take your, your, your best choice, but I can live with this one, but not this one. And so put your number one choice, one, you know, there. And then the guy that's tolerable, you put them second. So it's one place a show. That's the best way to describe it. Johnny Howard, then a place and show. Sounds good. Well, uh, thank you, Johnny Howard, for coming on the show. Yeah. I certainly well, thank appreciate you that me. and uh, wish you the best. And well, we want to be back after November 5th. That'd be great. You're welcome uh, to come yeah. back anytime, yeah. and uh, we'll see. Hopefully, you'll be back as city councilman of St. Paul. That's our dream. Well, thanks for coming on. It was okay. a pleasure to get to know you. All right. So that was uh, Johnny Howard. He's running for the St. Paul City Council. Uh, again, uh, his website is J-O-H-N-N-Y, Howard, H-O-W-A-R-D, uh, dot net. Uh, looked like a pretty great guy to me, looks like a strong candidate, and he, he has some great ideas to bring some uh, fresh vision to St. Paul and to really reestablish our communities as well. So uh, with that, we're going to be tapping into our East Coast correspondent, uh, Mr. Sam Wayne Pierce, if I can uh, figure out how to bring him on here. And uh, Sam, are you, uh, are you with us right now? Hi, Tony. Hello, Minnesota. Hello, Sam. How are you? That was a pretty impressive uh, candidate that we just had on uh, Johnny Howard running for the St. Paul City Council, don't you think? So, yes. Uh, I'm glad that you brought that up. I, I wanted to, before we get into our news topics, I wanted to make a couple comments. Uh, I, I don't know Mr. Howard personally, but what a heck of a candidate. I think maybe we should be sending him to Congress. I, um, <laughs> everything he said was, was uh, he, he made a lot of good points. Tony, I don't think you can overstate the importance of family. He talked about that. He talked about parents and their relationships with their kids and reading. And, um, and, then, and then one thing that just resonated with me when, when he said um, programs over prison. And it just seems like he has such a, such a grasp on what young men in this country need. And, and young men need to be, as boys and as, as teenagers and young men, they need to be in programs, whether it's sports or, or some sort of team building or, like he said, uh, job development skills. Young men in this country, more than ever, need to be involved in things. They need to have a sense of community, and I really liked everything he said. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. And I think that the, the esteem part of things, too, with, with young men and young boys especially, is uh, it's a very fragile thing to be able to keep because once that esteem part is lost or if somebody gets a ding on the, uh, a criminal record or or something to try to build up that esteem again 
where they feel like they have the confidence to enter into the workforce or to uh, interview for a job or to, to network for a job, I, I, it's, it's absolutely crucial because, I mean, let's face it, if you have a, a DUI on your record or if you have, a, a, say, some type of a drug charge or something, it can be the end of the world for that person, but at the same time, these are things that can be overcome. You know, just because you, you, you screwed up in the past, it doesn't mean that uh, your employment viability for the future is, is detrimental. Really, and Johnny Howard talked about that, it really comes down to building yourself back up again, reestablishing your esteem. And, and I think the community and the strength of the community that surrounds that person is probably the biggest predictor uh, or determinant of uh, that young man or woman's success. Great. Agreed. And he, he, uh, I love that he talked about the importance of the community, neighborhood watch, sit on your porches, pay attention, talk to each other. That is, that is so important. And so much of that is, seems lost in, in, American, uh, in America, but maybe more in American cities uh, than small towns. And, and I think he just made so many excellent points. So I wish him all the, the best of luck in his candidacy. Yeah, and uh, so I brought this up at the beginning of the show, Sam. Uh, Dallas Pearson won uh, the Suburban Community Channels Award uh, for 2013. Technical and production excellence. Pretty awesome, isn't it? Yeah, Tony, uh, I want to congratulate Dallas as well on the award. I can speak from my own personal experience when I say that everything, all week long, uh, the emails we get from Dallas and the input and the leadership he provides to putting the, the show on from the time that he calls me on the Skype and, and we prep for the show and coming on the air, he and the staff there do such an incredible job. Everything runs so smoothly. And when I was in studio last summer, I got to see just how much work they do. So, Tony, for you and I, it's easy. We just get to come on the air and, and talk. <laughs> we benefit from all of the production and preparation that Dallas and the, and the staff do for us. And um, we, it, none of it's possible without them. So, job well done. I, I congratulate him and, and thank him. Yeah, and it, you, there, there's nobody that works harder than, uh, than Dallas Pearson. There, there's no doubt about that. I mean, the guy lives, breathes, and eats video production. And, and apparently, he's got a full-time job, too, and, and, and he's married. So don't ask me how he pulls those two other feats off at the same time. But Well, Tony, um, I, I'm glad, you, uh, I'm glad you, you gave us a chance to give Dallas some praise. But uh, like Dallas, another great... Minnesotan was in the news this week. I was really happy to hear the Baltimore Ravens quarterback Joe Flacco speaking so highly of Matt Burke on ESPN yesterday morning on their on their main morning show. And I wanted to ask you what what's all this about? What's going on with Matt Burke's fitness challenge? Yeah, it's pretty uh, it's pretty incredible. Um, Matt Burke, since winning the Super Bowl uh, with the Ravens, has uh, you know he retired from the NFL with a Super Bowl ring which most people right then and there, they're like, okay, time to golf and, you know, go to exotic vacations for the rest of it. But not Matt Burke. Uh, he has decided to take on a new venture, and, and it's uh, part of the Vi Fitness Movement. And if you go to uh, the foot Facebook page, it's Matt Burke uh, Fitness Movement. So if you type in, in Facebook, Matt Burke Fitness Movement, uh, you'll find his Facebook page. Uh, but since winning the Super Bowl, He's lost 75 pounds, and he's done it just through uh, eating healthy, uh, working out every day, and uh, he's entered into a, a contest to become the next Vi Fitness model, which it, they have a, a, a one model every year, so this is for 2014. And so they're actually collecting votes, and there's only one day left, and he's number one right now. Out of hundreds of people who have submitted uh, their pictures uh, for this contest, it, he's number one. So if you go to that Facebook page, uh, Matt Burke Fitness Movement, uh, you'll find it that way. And uh, go, go and vote for him. And I think there's only like one or two days left to vote. And uh, it's pretty incredible. So if he wins and becomes the 2014 uh, Vi Fitness model, uh, he'll have an incredible platform uh, to get out there. And uh, basically, he's on a, a a mission or a crusade to end obesity in America. 
So it's pretty, uh, it's pretty phenomenal. I give him an incredible amount of credit because, I mean, if you go see the picture, he's got his shirt off and, you know, like, I mean, that takes an, a courage. Like, you wouldn't believe. Like, could you imagine doing that, Sam? Like, having to show the whole country a picture with you with, with your shirt off, like, posing and... Uh, just... uh, you know, Tony, I mean, no, uh, actually, uh, no, <laughs> I, I can't. And, uh, and he, uh, he looks like he's in tip top shape and, and the, the viewers should, should not only vote for him, but also, uh, I think you mentioned like his Facebook page for this movement because he gives all sorts of great tips and tricks and, um, fitness tips, not diet, how much water you should drink every day and when, uh, how you should work out. One of my favorites was the time uh, time under tension uh, trick where he says instead of doing 10 or 12 reps, try and do reps for a minute straight when mm. you're in the gym lifting. He talked about how um, you should, the more sophisticated and scientific the equipment, chances are the less good it's doing. And I thought that was very insightful because push-ups and pull-ups and chin-ups and sit-ups are a lot harder than the machines. But anyway, you can get all sorts of advice from him on, you know, like I said, diet, working out, healthy lifestyle. Yeah. It's really yeah. impressive. Yeah, my, my favorite tip that he offered uh, was when you wake up in the morning, the, the, one of the first things you should do is drink 16 ounces of water, preferably at room temperature. So you just drink a glass of water. And so I've been doing that ever since I, I read that tip on the Facebook page, Matt Burke Fitness Movement. And it's actually a great way to start the day. Like I, my hunger pains kind of disappear. I eat less for breakfast. I, my stomach and the organs, apparently, they get, they get working. And um, I thought it was a pretty simple but effective tip to live more healthy. Absolutely. Yep, great, great stuff. It's, so, uh, Sam, what, have you been uh, paying attention to the news? I read uh, something somewhere um, that Condoleezza Rice has been chosen uh, to be part of the uh, NCAA tournament selections. Can, can you talk about that? Yeah, Tony, this is, a, this is a good transition for us because Matt Burke obviously made his name on the football field, and, and the former Secretary of State, Condoleezza Rice, this week was in the news um, in part because she was never on the football football field, obviously. Um, what happened was she was named one of the 13 inaugural members of the College Football Playoff Selection Committee. So, Tony, to make a long story about college football short, major college football really, really needed uh, a better system for determining its champion every year. Um, so starting next year, this 13-person committee will select the top four teams at the end of the season to participate in the playoff. The committee is made up mostly of older men that have been around football their whole lives. Uh, Archie Manning, who played college football then in the NFL, and now he has the two famous sons, Peyton and Eli, in the NFL. He's an example of the type of person that's on this committee. Well, uh, also on the committee is Condi Rice. And, of course... That drew some criticism. Notable critics came out and said, how can she possibly make important football decisions when she's clearly never played football? And, Tony, I understand that logic. I, I understood the game a lot better after playing, and I'm sure you'd say the same thing. But it's not like college football named Condi Rice king of the game and whatever she says goes. She's one of 13 on a panel that will make these decisions. She's a huge fan. She's a student of the game. When she was the provost at Stanford, she oversaw a, a very uh, adept, uh, successful athletic department. So, Tony, I think a year from now, we'll be talking about what a, what a great job she's done. Or we won't be talking about it at all because it'll be a non-story because she's doing so well. And I think this week she actually had the chance to address some of her cr critics and did quite well. Yeah, we did. And we're going to, uh, we're going to line up a, a clip here of her, actually, that was on ESPN. So, Dallas, if you could uh, help us to line that up, and uh, we'll get that going. And uh, we'll just see how she responds to some of the criticism and some of the questions about her being uh, uh, picked for this. Of the selection committee. Well, I was first approached by Larry Scott, who's the Pac-12 uh, commissioner, and uh, Larry said that they were putting together the playoff committee, uh, the committee to select the four teams for the national playoff, and he said, uh, a number of the commissioners would like you to serve. 
And I said, well, why on earth would you want me to serve? And uh, he talked about uh, the importance of having people with diverse perspectives. He talked about the importance of being able to make decisions under pressure. And uh, then he talked about the fact that I've actually been a part of the college football system. When I was provost at Stanford, Stanford Athletics uh, reported to me. So I've been in and around this game for a long time. I'm a huge fan of college football, and I'm really looking forward to having a chance to try to get this playoff system right. So you didn't lobby for the job. They approached you aggressively. Well, um, Larry Scott actually took me out to dinner and talked to me about doing it. I had to check into time commitments and the issues. I also uh, called Bob Bowlesby, my old friend from Stanford, who was Stanford's athletic director and is now commissioner of the Big 12. And I also talked to, uh, to Jack Swarick, uh, Swarick at, at Notre Dame because I just wanted to have a sense that this was something that the um, commissioners would uh, really be happy to see take place. So I did my homework a little bit before I said yes. Now you've received overwhelming support, but there have been a handful of critics. Former Auburn head coach Pat Dye was asked about the selection. Condi, he said the following quote, all she knows about football is what somebody told her or what she read in a book or what she saw on television. To understand football, you gotta play with your hand in the dirt. I love Condoleezza Rice and she's probably a good statesman and all of that. But how in the hell does she know what it's like out there when you can't get your breath and it's 110 degrees and the coach asks, you got some more? Condi, if Pat Rice, or Pat Dye, excuse me, were sitting here right now, what would you say to him? I would say, coach, I respect you. I remember your great run at Auburn and I certainly respect you, but I just respectfully disagree. Uh, there are others on the committee who've not played football. I, I just might note, you know, with all due respect to my dear friend Roger Goodell and Paul Tagliabue, probably the most influential NFL commissioner was Pete Rozell. He never played football. So you can be a student of something and not experience it. And I consider myself a student of college football. Um, I am, Colin, after all, a, a student of Russia, but I've actually never been Russian either. Uh, you, can, you can know something from following it and studying it, and I spend a lot of my Saturday with college football. So Sam, do you, uh, do you happen to agree with that uh, anal analysis that she made? Do you have to experience something or play football in order to know football? Um, to, to a certain extent, but I think, again, she's one of 13 on a panel, Tony, so I, I think she will do just fine. I think she will bring a unique perspective, and, and like I said, a year from now, I, I don't even think we're talking about it. But there is another former Secretary of State and leading lady of politics that I think we will be talking about for quite some time. That's, of course, Hillary Clinton. Tony, news out of Atlanta this week is that Hillary took a subtle jab at one of her possible... 2016 presidential primary rivals, one of your favorites, current Vice President Joe Biden. Uh, is this a story, or should we just expect to start seeing Hillary taking jabs at all sorts of people for the next three years? Well, yeah, I, I read something about that. There was apparently at this private, uh, I don't know if it was a fundraiser or some type of a political event where there were no cameras, no, no reporters allowed, uh, but there did happen to be a uh, Republican congressman who was in the audience, and he was the one who went out and uh, leaked some of this information. But apparently, uh, she took a, a jab at Vice President Joe Biden because uh, he said that he actually did not want to go in and uh, kill Osama bin Laden. And uh, I just I thought it was I thought it was pretty interesting. Or certainly that he was uh, much more cautious about it, but that she, the heroic Hillary knew all along that this would be successful and it's, it, hey you know what I'm sure it's it, all the credit goes to her <laughs> you know um, it, it's uh, it's interesting because after Mitt Romney's uh, little episode with the 47 percent comment in a fundraiser I think this is going to be the new normal that we get these bits and pieces of stories that come out of fundraisers and conferences where the media is not allowed but that it, you're, you're right that's what happened a Republican congressman was in was at the event he went to the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, the newspaper, told this story. Uh, I'm not shocked. Yeah, and you know, no. it, it, if I had the choice, there's no doubt I'd rather have President Hillary Clinton than President Joe Biden. No questions asked. And I'm actually going to make a pretty bold prediction here on the Tony Hernandez show. I know we're a far way away from the 2016 election, 
Uh, but here's my prediction is Americans are going to be faced with a big choice in 2016. They are going to be faced with the choice to vote for either President Clinton or a President Bush. I think it's going to be Hillary Clinton versus Jeb Bush in the 2016 election. Do you think that's a good prediction, Sam? Ugh, uh, certainly it's going to be the former secretary, Hillary Clinton, running for, for president on the Democratic ticket. I, I have no doubt. Uh, oh, wow. Uh, another Bush and another... another Oh, I don't know, Tony. We could, uh, we could do our uh, Is There Royalty in America yeah. episode all over again if, if that turns out to be the case. But it doesn't seem like that there is anyone that's going to emerge from the Republican field uh, except for uh, Jeb Bush. He seems to be the one that has the most momentum and most people calling for him to enter the race. And, of course, he hasn't uh, announced his intentions or anything with that yet. But uh, we'll have to see. And we'll have to see as well as to what kind of a role uh, Obamacare is going to play in the 2016 election. It'll, it'll be interesting. Yeah. And, and, Tony, I think you need to uh, call me out a little on a few weeks ago when I said that we needed to give the Obamacare exchanges some time. Um, so uh, so since, since we're all for accountability here on, on the Tony Hernandez show, um, look, I tried to give the federal exchanges some benefit of the doubt based on my own professional understanding for how difficult a massive software rollout is. Um, but they've had several years and, and several hundred billion dollars to work with. And this isn't just glitches or simple coding problems like, you know, Nancy Pelosi would want you to believe. Um, it's an unmitigated disaster. Uh, I'm going to give you, in our last couple minutes here, some estimated numbers. But first point out, the federal government hasn't even released its own official numbers yet, Tony. This would be like Apple telling its shareholders three weeks into a new iPhone or iPad release. We don't know exactly how many we've sold yet, but trust us, business is good. Um, that being said, some private sector analysis has revealed that in the first week, less than 1% of those people that wanted to sign up actually got signed up and enrolled successfully, Tony. Less than 1%. In the three weeks total since it launched, the best estimate I could find in my research was that about 36,000 people have been successfully enrolled. The Obama administration has been claiming that this will ensure almost 50 million uninsured people ultimately. Um, an estimate of almost 10 million people tried to sign up. 36,000 is a tiny fraction of 10 million or an even tinier fraction of 50 million. Uh, this is... Uh, this, this is not off to a good start for, uh, for the Obama administration, and it will be interesting to see how the Republicans run against it in 2014 and how both sides handle it in the 2016 presidential election. Mm -hmm. And it's all going to be determined by the results. And I know that Minsure, which is the local Minnesota exchange, uh, their enrollment numbers, they're out. Uh, as the Star Tribune reports, they're a bit murky. Uh, there's conflicting numbers here, but I'll go off of this report from TwinCities.com by Christopher Snowbeck. Uh, he said more than 3,700 people have used the website of Minsure. Uh, and then he said that that tally includes 406 Minnesotans who are making plans to pay for private health insurance policies that they got through the state-run uh, marketplace. And then they said an additional uh, 3,000 uh, 363 state residents have used the health exchange website in the two weeks since its launch to determine eligibility for Medicaid and the Minnesota Care public health insurance programs. Um, these aren't staggering numbers, and you know one thing that I brought up over and over uh, during uh, our campaign was was the fact that in Minnesota we actually have an incredibly high coverage rate. Ninety percent of Minnesotans have some form of health insurance, whether it's from their private employer, whether it's from uh, Minnesota Care, whether it's from Medicaid, Medicare, 90% uh, of our, our citizens are covered. And the 10%, the they estimate, they're not covered simply uh, just based off of choice. Like they choose not to be covered because they're young and healthy or whatever. So it remains to be seen what Obamacare is going to do uh, to increase coverage or, or to help people who, who really need it. And uh, We'll just have to see as these weeks and months and years go forward. And uh, Sam, we are out of time here. I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in to the Tony Hernandez Show. We broadcast live every Saturday from 4 o'clock until 5 o'clock in SCC Television Studios and on a YouTube channel, Tony Hernandez Show. May God bless you. 
May God bless America and vaya con Dios.